let's celebrate a rebuilding milestone in Boulder County. Utility companies have high-tech ideas to prevent wildfires. Guess who paid for them? The governor is getting attention for a political feud. I think he's making the same mistake his critics did during the pandemic. If you know more people catching COVID lately, you are not imagining it. A key indicator says there's more on the way. And no Friday comes and goes around here without your good news making headlines, because the news should be more than just the worst things that happened today. Because this is next. A shooting this afternoon closed one of the biggest routes through downtown Denver, Broadway at Spear. A man was killed in that shooting near the Enterprise shop and a woman was seriously hurt. Police are saying very little other than they have arrested one person and they're looking for somebody else, also searching for this car, Silver Chrysler 200, with front left side damage. The first permit is in hand to rebuild a home that burned in the Marshall Fire in unincorporated Boulder County. That milestone came the same week that this couple, Terry and Ed, got the first go ahead to rebuild within the town of Superior. Out in the county side, they have 158 families working on getting permits to replace what was lost. Well, one down, make that 157. In total, the Marshall Fire burned 1,084 homes, so it's going to be difficult to rebuild all of them in the time that insurance normally allows. So Colorado's Division of Insurance passed an emergency rule today. The rule deals specifically with the time limits for living expenses and the time limits for repairing and rebuilding. The state says those limits can now be extended for more time if an insurance company causes what they call an unreasonable delay in settling a claim. So if the clock runs out on homeowners coverage and they're still working on a rebuild, they can request an extension. Colorado's utility companies had to explain today how they're trying to prevent wildfires. State regulators want to hear directly from Excel and Tri-State. Our Marshall Zellinger listened in on some interesting and expensive ideas. Drones, cameras, satellite imagery. These are ways Colorado utility companies told state regulators they are monitoring to prevent wildfires and protect transmission lines. We have had mitigation practices in place for years and years. Um, we just never called them fire mitigation. It was more in the past about reliability. That is a subtle difference explained by Tri-State, trying to prevent vegetation from starting a fire versus trying to prevent vegetation from taking people's power out for an extended period of time. Tri-State actually covers four states, including more rural areas of Colorado, like Craig and Meeker, where this map shows high fire risk in areas where Tri-State has utility lines. This part of the presentation used satellite imagery from Telluride to show how Tri-State uses remote sensing to determine the height of trees and vegetation to figure out areas that need to be addressed. The point of all this is it helps us determine where we would we should spend our dollars and and doing sort of what we have far more need for wildfire mitigation uh, than we do uh, funds. Excel talked about increasing sensitivity on hardware like this during days that are high risk for wildfire. What we're trying to do is if there's a tree that had fallen on the line, essentially prevent um, the system from trying to re-energize and thus, thus cause a fire. While that might keep people's power off longer than in the past, it could prevent the power line from starting a fire. Part of Excel's presentation also included modeling of how poles handle 90 mile per hour winds and how the models can reveal poles that perhaps might lean too far and would need to be replaced. This hearing was more about what is being done and what the state might need to ask utility companies to do in the future. There doesn't appear to be a finish line in sight here. There just wasn't a discussion about how much it would cost utility companies, thus how much it would cost you, at least for Excel's example. Uh, there's a current wildfire mitigation cost that's passed through the customers. It's 63 cents per month. It does not sound outlandish, but if there needs to be more, Excel will likely go back to the Public Utilities Commission and ask to pass more through to the customer. I feel like if there's something that people would be willing to pay for, it would be things to keep the state from burning down. That said, it'll be up to regulators to determine who is paying in the end. Yeah, these three commissioners, I've, I've watched their hearings on the, the winter storm from a year ago, February, and yeah. how much that we still don't know how much Excel will be allowed to pass through to us. And they've had discussions about like, at some point, you're gonna have to dig into your own pocket, and perhaps it's not because of that winter storm, but in the future, there may 
could be rules or state law that says you can only do so much to the customer and so much to your investors. Yeah, because they're the other part of this. There's the money they get from customers, and then there are the investors that also have skin in the game. Marshall, thank you. State legislatures moving a step closer to making fentanyl possession a felony. Even if people just have a trace amount of fentanyl inside another substance, and even if people are not aware they have it. Prosecutors insisted it was just too hard to prove if somebody knew that the, the pill or powder they're caught with contained fentanyl. So legislators took that part out. There were Republicans and Democrats on both sides of the Senate vote today. The fentanyl bill now has to be squared away with the House version before it can head to the governor for his signature. Another bill moving through the legislature would provide help for people who are struggling with a gambling addiction. The groups that track this stuff estimate that more than 102,000 Coloradans have a gambling addiction. That'd be 2.4% of the adult population, just slightly more than the national average. So not great, especially considering that the latest study on problem gambling ranked Colorado 37th in the country for the type of funds that we dedicate to fighting gambling addiction. This bill would add nearly three mil to that. Clearly what we need is resources. And so going from $130,000 um, on an annual basis to three million is a big jump in terms of the number of resources that are gonna be allocated through this grant program. So that's the first thing that's needed to make sure that more people can um, uh, can get certified and become counselors and provide more uh, treatment to those who need it. That was Democratic Speaker of the House Alec Garnett, who pushed for legalized gambling, is now trying to clean up some of the mess that came with it. He said he does expect that bill to pass. Tina Peters is a busy woman. The Republican clerk from Mesa County is running for Secretary of State. She's facing felony charges for allegedly tampering with voting systems. Her criminal defense fund these days is getting run out of the state of Wisconsin by the MyPillow guy, Mike Lindell. And Peters recently made a pilgrimage down to Florida, to Mar-a-Lago, where candidates go to get the endorsement of former President Trump. No announcement on that yet. Peters was at the former president's resort for a premiere of a movie that alleges election rigging without offering evidence of that. Legal filings show that Peters got court approval to leave the state of Colorado while facing those felonies. Republican District Attorney Dan Rubenstein from Mesa County told us, quote, while I've got some concerns about Ms. Peters as a potential flight risk due to her access to private flight travel and history of going into hiding during this investigation, I must balance the importance of assuring her appearance in court against the risk that her bond conditions do not properly influ improperly influence the upcoming election. The DA continued, I struck that balance by asking the court to allow travel, provided she gave details about her whereabouts when out of state. Peters has not responded to multiple interview requests to take our questions here on Next. You can see extended interviews with both of her Republican primary opponents for Secretary of State. Those are on the Next YouTube channel. Democratic Governor Jared Polis continues to get national attention for attacking Republican Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida mostly for DeSantis's retaliation against Disney for supporting gay rights. But listen to what Polis said on MSNBC today. We don't retaliate based on your politics. That's a very authoritarian mindset. That's what uh, Putin does. That's what Chavez uh, uh, did and Maduro. Some thoughts on that. I, we're all smart enough to know what's going on here. Governor DeSantis is targeting Disney to raise his profile if he runs for president. Governor Polis is attacking DeSantis to raise his profile if he runs for president. You can agree or disagree with either of their politics, and, and I don't begrudge either for trying to appeal to their respective political bases. It's the Putin thing that I got hung up on today. Vladimir Putin is invading a sovereign country right now, leading to the deaths of innocent civilians, including children. We see those heartbreaking images daily. Governor DeSantis may be auditioning for for authoritarian, curious voters, but he is not ordering the slaughter of civilians. I remember back to when Governor Polis's critics during the pandemic lockdown compared him to Hitler. Those Coloradans beclowned themselves with that kind of hyperbole. And I think that Governor Polis would be smart to avoid it as well. Talk radio host Dan Kaplis, who called for the outing of Douglas County teachers who left class to protest, says that his law partner is a hero for trying to get those teachers' individual names. Though Kaplis says he was unaware that his partner Mike Kane was the person behind the effort to get the names. Kane withdrew his open records request after teachers had been warned that their outing was imminent. 
Dubco School says its legal team reached out to Kane to convince him to back off. Kane told us that he asked for the teachers' names in his personal capacity as a parent and not because his law partner was publicly calling on the radio for the teachers to be identified by name. Last week, state legislators passed a bill to protect teachers' absence records from similar public records requests. Teachers had testified before the legislature that they felt intimidated by the conservative talk radio calls to identify them by name. So this week is your 100th Word of Thanks microgiving campaign and what incredible work you have done for nonprofits around our state. $8.9 million raised for causes that improve the lives of our neighbors in all kinds of ways. So this week, to celebrate your century mark, we are boosting three nonprofits all at once. And we're also partnering with Impact 100. It's a group of women in our community who each year pool their donations and they try to do what we do, which is to make one big impact at a time. And they're going to donate more than $100,000 to these nonprofits. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks, you can join me in support. Text the word thanks to 303 871 1491. You can join me in supporting three nonprofits. You got the Learning Source where adults learn English, get their high school degree, learn specific skills so they can get ahead in their career, plus volunteers for Outdoor Colorado. For decades, that nonprofit has organized volunteers around our state to do cleanups and tree plantings, wildfire mitigation, and wildfire restoration. And the third nonprofit that's benefiting from every dollar we raise together is Mikasa Resource Center in Denver. They specialize in entrepreneurship education for women and low-income families. Mikasa helps them build small businesses so that they can create stable incomes and self-sufficiency. Together, your Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns are headed for the $9 million mark with this triple impact this week. You may think Colorado's COVID levels are low, but the proof is in the poo. This whole wastewater-based epidemiology is, is kind of a new field. And for the first time since before the pandemic, people are back in person at the Denver Botanic Gardens. That is good news, and they have even more of it for us next. You might be noticing people around you coming down with COVID-19 more often. It's no coincidence, cases across Colorado are rising faster than they were a few weeks ago. It's similar to a rise that we saw about this time last year. Now, thankfully, far more Coloradans are protected now through vaccines, prior infection, both. Our Kitty Eastman explains how the spike in cases is quite apparent even without having people test for the virus. There it is in its purest form, human waste. Straight from the sewer before South Platte Renew treats it. This is the first stop of testing. From this tube, scientists put a little bit into these tubes and send it off to be tested for the virus that causes COVID-19. We're, we're like the uh, canary in the coal mine, so to speak. We get to see it first and and uh, get an idea of what's coming in the, in the future. Blair Corning, the deputy director of environmental programs here, says that glimpse of the future right now is interesting. Currently, we we're having a big spike, like the second biggest spike. There was a big one back around December and it's spiking up again. Data from BioBot, the company South Platte contracts with, backs that up. This graph shows the prevalence of the virus in Littleton and Englewood's wastewater. That last data point is from May 1st. I've been watching it, we get it uh, twice a week. State epidemiologists from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment said in an email, they are seeing a recent increase in COVID-19 cases, but there may also be a higher prevalence in the wastewater because people may be taking rapid tests at home and those results are not included on our dashboard. A spike on a graph is concerning, but state health officials still believe the high levels of immunity from vaccinations will help protect Coloradans from being hospitalized and keep that patient spike lower than before. For next, I'm Katie Eastman. COVID-19 hospitalizations have ticked up in our state, though not at the rate that we saw this time last year. Right now, there are 119 people in Colorado's hospitals that have COVID. And bear in mind, many of them may be in the hospital primarily for something else. 
beautiful end to a week where we had two storms and an inch of rain in the gauge. And now we're into the 80s and we go even warmer on Saturday. Along with the warmth will come the wind as a weak weather system approaches Colorado, but is pushed northward by a blocking ridge of high pressure. That means concerns for high fire danger. Again, red flag warnings are posted. Gusty winds over 25 miles per hour, low relative humidity values. Not a lot of moisture for eastern Colorado, but in Craig and Maybell Steamboat, yeah, maybe an afternoon shower up that way, but we're not going to get that rain here in Denver as we head into this holiday weekend. So mid 80s tomorrow, mid 70s for Mother's Day and for Monday, Tuesday. We might have record high temperatures on Wednesday, but not a lot of rain in that extended forecast. Enjoy your weekend. Our good news is that today we've been married 50 years. An anniversary, Mother's Day weekend, a Friday. Hey, we don't need an excuse, though, to celebrate goodness around here. It is human joy on the TV news. Who would have thought? Next. If you are a mother or are missing one or wishing that you were one, all the flowers you see around town this weekend, they are for you. There are a ton of them at the Denver Botanic Gardens, where our Byron Reed turned up with his camera and our favorite Friday question. What's your good news? We're starting the day off by coming to the Botanic Gardens. Good news of the day is a great plant sale. Carol Fabic. Rudy Fabic. We have a plan. We're trying to figure out exactly where everything going to go. Our good news is that today we've been married 50 years. Otherwise you could just go crazy and just buy anything that looks pretty and everything looks pretty. I'm Shauna Johnston. I'm Zach and this is Rowan. And what a surprise to realize that they're having a yard sale and a plant, plant sale. sale. Good news of the day is this is our first time here and it was a lot of fun. What works for here doesn't necessarily work in our yard. In our yard. <laughs> He's pretty sleepy. I don't think he was super <laughs> impressed. <laughs> 50 years today we were married. Yes. And we're still in love. Just something to do for Mother's Day weekend. Check out the gardens mostly. Yeah. yeah. We call it this when we raise children. Yeah, we work if together like this. If you don't do this with children, yeah. things happen. Yeah, yeah, you have to work together. It's hard. It was a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> communicate, communicate, communicate. Without question. Talk That's it. about everything. We can get to work when we get home. That's good news. <laughs> That's our good news. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Mother's Day. <laughs> They're so cute. You see that 50 year couple are searching for each other's hand down there. That's so sweet. Uh, this is the first time in two years the spring plant sale has been in person at the Botanic Garden, so naturally, it's sold out. It's a sign of the times, not the before times, the how much toilet paper can we hoard in our basement time. That and your feedback next. It's a sign that the pandemic is over for the hoarders who are prepping for a bathroom apocalypse. Remember when everybody was buying way more toilet paper than they needed? Well, somebody is sick of holding on to their stash. After two years, they are wiped. So they're turning to a Facebook group in Colorado to give away their pandemic toilet paper hoard. It's 40 rolls available in the Sloan's Lake area to any taker. There was a warning. Apparently, it's the low-quality stuff we all rushed to get, and it's not very soft. Send us signs you see, literal, metaphorical, email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. A suggestion for a word of thanks campaign to benefit volunteer fire departments. I would love to talk to volunteer firefighters who have an idea on this. Remember, we featured search and rescue teams working through a statewide nonprofit. If there's a similar nonprofit that can touch a bunch of volunteer fire departments in the state, drop me a note. Let's have a conversation. See you next time.